Hello, I'm Annabelle Tiffin. In the next 20 minutes, failed by the system, the long-awaited report into last summer's riots blames this on a lack of stake in society. We bring you reaction to those findings. But first, let me introduce this week's guest, Stephen Mosley, the Conservative MP for Chester. Hello. We have Bill Esterson, the Labour MP for Sefton Central, Hello. and the Liberal Democrat MP for Cheadle, Mark Hunter. Welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us. Now, it's almost eight months since Manchester, Salford and Liverpool, along with several other major cities, erupted in the worst riots for a generation. The cost of the region was more than £12 million, and more than 450 people were arrested. Well, now an independent panel, appointed by the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister, has produced its report into the causes. Our political editor, Arif Ansari, has been looking at it. It was a smash-and-grab raid on a city-wide scale. First Liverpool, then Salford and Manchester faced concentrated violence and looting. We know what happened, but why? I think it was just youngsters just not really bothering about anyone else and just thinking, oh, we'll, we'll get some action here and see what we can get out of it. There's a lot of young ones around here that don't seem to get a lot of help. There's, there's, you know, there's a connections place and things, but... There's not enough incentive for them to work. People I know still haven't been caught for it, but obviously I'm not going to say who, but like, it's like they can just walk about and nothing's being done. It's like, well, you've got away with it, so why not do it again? To avoid that, an independent panel was set up to investigate. It says there are half a million forgotten families without a stake in society bumping along the bottom. I always find it shocking when presented with the starkness of, 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 the kind of some individuals' views about their lives and their prospects and the fact that they have no hopes and dreams. So among the panel's recommendations, councils should identify children as young as 11 at risk of future unemployment. Children should be better protected from big brand marketing and that schools should be fined if they fail to properly teach any pupils to read or write. But one shopkeeper targeted in the riots says there's also a simpler problem. In the report it states that the average uh, person who was arrested and put away for crimes during the riots committed 11 crimes. Um, now, if they'd committed 11 crimes, they are, that's their job. They go out every day and do their job committing crimes. But perhaps nobody fully understands what happened last August, let alone how to fix it. Well, joining us in the studio is Dan Silva, who's the director of the Salford-based Social Action and Research Foundation, which has been com compiling its own research into the riots. Did you find that what you found matched what the panel found? Well, we were building on work I did with The Guardian and the London School of Economics reading the riots project, which spoke to rioters across the country. And we were, spoke, we were looking for a more local perspective, whereas Dara Singh's report uh, goes for the national right. angle. However, I think there was a lot of crossover. Um, the balance between individual responsibility and the need to look at pressing social problems, the fact it was complex causes and that mm. we need complex solutions, I think there was a lot of crossover with the report and we welcome it. Really. And what did you find from talking to local people? I think, I think people were, were quite keen to look at the, the implications to social policy that we need to look at now. Mm. So in Salford, young people reported that this was the best day of their lives, some young people. Mm. So the feeling was, well, what do we need to do as a society to, mm. make, to make things happen that it isn't the best day of their lives to go down mm. to the, the precinct? But also people were very positive about the community work that is being done in Salford and Manchester, mm. the many young people who did um, come out and help tidy and up the up cities. The, the, yeah. the next day and, and were genuinely shocked about it and, and angered, weren't they? But at the beginning, certainly, there was a lot of rhetoric, wasn't there, saying that this was pure criminality. In fact, David Cameron was really mm. just saying it was, it, that's what it was, pure and simple. Uh, I think we can see there's a huge number of causes, just as a huge number of solutions. But when you do look at the people who are involved in these offences, those who were convicted, on average, had 11 previous convictions. So it is people who have been engaged in criminality before getting involved. So we really do have to look at the, the criminal system, we have to look at rehabilitation, mm. we have to look at the effectiveness of short sentences, which don't seem to be working at getting people back onto the right track. Mm. So, so when it criticises, for instance, schools, Mark Hunter, and it's saying that schools recommends, in fact, that schools should be fined if people aren't being taught properly, do you think <laughs> that's fair? 
Well, I think it's difficult to prove whether or not people are being taught properly. There's all kinds of factors involved here, including family circumstances. And, and I think the research is immensely valuable at looking into the root causes, the reasons why the riots happened in the first place. But, you know, we shouldn't be drawn into making excuses for the criminal activity that took place at the time. And it was very easy, it seems to me, for politicians to become armchair police commanders at the time and criticise what was going on, the way the police handled it. In actual fact, our job was to back up the police and support mm. them, in my view, and make it quite clear that these criminal elements um, could not and would not be allowed to get mm. away with it. Bill Esterson. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I'd like to say about it is not everybody who lives in a deprived community took Absolutely. part in these riots. Mm -hmm. And I think the overwhelming majority of people who comes from a poor gra background was actually appalled by it. And you can see that by the reaction. In places like Toxteth, where 30 years ago the riots were on a completely different scale mm -hmm. to what happened last year, the community there stepped in and said, enough, we're not having this, and they stopped the riots happening. And I think mm -hmm. that is a very, very encouraging sign for our communities. What I would say is that we need to look at the role of government. As we've got three members of parliament here today, what is government's role in learning the lessons and making sure it doesn't happen again as far as we are able? And I have to say that cutting the police by 16,000 isn't a step in the right direction. And I think that when we've got an economy that's flatlining, that's not going to help where you've got over a million people, young people out of work. So I think we need the government to take note of what's okay. going on in the so economy. If you, if you and actually look at the police it. numbers, I know the, the Labour Party have said police numbers are something to do. It, but the report doesn't actually talk about that no, at all. No. And if you look at London, well, where this all started, up, I mean, it's police not a numbers are actually up over mm. the past four years. Mm. So, so policing is, is sort of a bit, a bit, a bit of a red herring. It is more the social problem. Well, I don't think 16,000 like loss of 16,000 16, police is a red herring, Stephen. I no, think but it wasn't the fact the for the riots. I, 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 I didn't say, didn't say what, it was. I don't think what point I'm making is that losing 16,000 frontline police, both of which you opposed before the election, by the way, that's not going to help in the future if we get a reoccurrence. I think the key is to stop it happening again, mm. but certainly cutting police numbers isn't going to help. I mean, I think it's a bit, a bit wider than just police numbers, although I think that's a factor as well. So the government's recently published their social justice strategy, which aims at integrating people into the workplace. But as there's no jobs around, as we found through our community conversations, as areas that experience intergenerational unemployment or certainly in work poverty. So I think more needs to be done to address that rather than just There's police. been a lot of talk, sorry to interrupt, there's been a lot of talk about troubled families, hasn't there? And, and I think you were saying that it's not all communities because there are something like two 2000, I've got the numbers here, not something like, two, but there are trouble, something like more than 2,000 troubled families in Lancashire and there weren't riots there. So can we blame poor parenting? Uh, I think you've got, I think broken families is a, one issue, but it's also individual responsibility. Why do two children from the same sort of area, some get involved, some don't? What makes those people go forward, want to p play a part in society, want to get a job, want to get educated, whereas someone else doesn't? Uh, when, it, when it comes to troubled families, I think the government announcement this week has been absolutely fantastic, where they've chosen three areas in the northwest mm. out of ten. The panel criticised it, though, saying it perhaps wasn't targeting the right areas, the troubled family unit. Well, the, the troubled family uh, fund, which has started this week, has they've looked at the ten largest local authorities that have got the most problems. In the northwest, we've got Manchester, Liverpool and Lancashire, and they're moving those forward. It's a £450 million pound mm. scheme over three years. Do you think this is yeah, going to work? Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not against putting money into troubled families. Far from it, I think that absolutely we should be supporting families who've got difficult backgrounds. But the reality is what the government went, did when it came in, it cut the early intervention grant as an example that goes to local government. Local government in the metropolitan areas has suffered the biggest scale of cuts anywhere in the country. And I think that it's struggling. It, it's the struggle between local government and uh, the police, the fire service, uh, and uh, to some extent even the health service, where we've seen uh, big, big cuts very, very early on that the agencies aren't really in a position to work together to support some of these families. Uh, I'm not saying there's anything wrong in having a troubled families unit, but I do think that taking the resources away, which is what has happened so far under this government, is not okay, going to help. Let me so just so bring I, Mark back I think we need quickly. to look at that because I, I think the report is absolutely right that we need to work with let Mark come back. I think most people understand that whichever party had been in government right now, the, cu the cuts which we've seen on a very similar scale, the Labour Party have admitted this in Parliament, would have had to happen. So I, I think quite so and if you look choice. if you look at individual local authorities you will see very different approaches being taken the kind of local authority where uh, that where my constituency is in Stockport, for example, have largely protected frontline services. Okay, very we haven't briefly. haven't reduced those kinds I'm of things just that bring people depend on. Dan, back in. Do you think, having listened to this, do you feel encouraged that 
the riots couldn't happen again? I'm not sure. I mean, I think the, the, one of the positive things about the report was they spoke about building on people's capabilities mm -hmm. rather than this discussion of broken Britain mm -hmm. or needing mm -hmm. to man troubled yeah. families, which I think if there was more talk about positive yeah. aspirations and skills that already exist within yep. communities across okay. the political spectrum, that would be very helpful. And, and that's why right. we need the emphasis to be on jobs for young people okay. and action for families. I'm going to just stop you there, but thank you very much for the time being. Now, everyone's heard of thalamidamide, the drug prescribed to expectant mothers, which cause devastating birth defects in babies. But few will recognize the name Primados. It, too, was given to pregnant women in the 1960s, and some claim it, too, led to children being bo born with malformations. But no link has ever been proved, and the company behind the drug says it was safe. Now the MP for Bolton South East is calling for a new inquiry into the issue. Amy Cornwell's been to meet one of her constituents who believes she was affected by Primados. Sleeping tablets because of the pain. Long-term... Antibiotics for my kidney. Nicola Williams takes 60 pills a day. Her medical problems might not be obvious to the eye, but she spent most of her life in and out of hospital after being born with multiple malformations to her internal organs. My stomach is on the wrong side. Um, there was lots and lots of adhesions and blockages. All the way up through primary, I was in and out of hospital under tests and studies on my bladder and my stomach and it was only last year on a routine um, cancer check that they actually told me that I had seven spleens which I was totally unaware of. And she's convinced this was the cause, Primados, a drug prescribed to her mother. The tablet was launched in 1958 as a hormone pregnancy test, but several studies in the 1960s raised concerns about the safety of hormone pregnancy tests in general. In 1967, Dr Isabel Gall noted a possible link between them and malformation in babies. Two years later, the Royal College of General Practitioners noted a higher rate of miscarriages among women who'd used them. In 1970, the company behind Primados stopped promoting it as a pregnancy test. And then in 1975, the Committee on the Safety Safety of Medicines issued an official warning to women not to take Primidus if they were pregnant. A group called the Association for Children Damaged by Hormone Pregnancy Test launched a legal challenge against the drug's makers, Shearing AG, in 1982. But the group dropped the case after lawyers advised them there wasn't enough evidence against the company and no link has ever been proved. Now the association has initial funding from the legal aid panel to mount a new challenge against the company, which has since been taken over by Bayer. It says it has new evidence in the form of a letter written by the medical director of Shearings in 1967, in which he says the apparent correlation between the drug and malformations looks rather alarming. We need an apology. I feel that we need compensating for the, the effect it's had on our lives. And also, we'd, we're not sure of what's going to happen because I'm probably one of the eldest victims and we don't know what's going to happen later on in life. In a statement, Bayer told us it's generally accepted that the conclusions of the older studies were scientifically flawed and it doesn't accept that Bayer has any case to answer in relation to the marketing of Primados by shearing. It denies that Primados was responsible for causing any deformities in children. But Nicola's MP wants a debate in Parliament about the drug and has tabled an early day motion calling for an independent public inquiry into the issue. This is, I think, effectively, here's the forgotten thalidomide and I, I'm actually appalled at the fact that uh, so little has been done by the authorities in our country, the government of the time, as well as the pharmaceutical companies. Nicola says tests have shown her problems are not due to faulty genes, but proving what did cause them is much more difficult. My son, he calls me Terminator because I've been put back together so many times and I always come back. And it's so sad because of what my mum went through and because of what I've been through and another generation is suffering because of this. 
Joining me is Patrick Walsh, a lawyer who's a specialist in serious injury law. Uh, law. And uh, there's no link between the drug and disabilities um, that has been proven. As far as I'm aware, it's not been proved that, that there is a link between this particular drug and the no. disabilities. So this is going to be very difficult then for claimants? It, it is difficult because uh, a key element in winning any claim for compensation is that you establish the relationship between the drug or the substance you've been exposed to and the actual illness or disease or condition that you've developed. Mm. If you can't prove that link, then the claim won't succeed. Mm. But on a, and on a different matter, but still a, a long-term campaign, encouraging news this week for people who've been exposed to asbestos and become ill. That's right. It's uh, very good news. Um, there's been a case which has been running now for the best part of six years. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled uh, uh, on Wednesday that... Uh, people who had been refused compensation payments by employers' liability insurers uh, would be entitled to payments. Mm. Uh, what had happened is that the insurers had argued on the wording of certain insurance policies that uh, they weren't required to pay compensation to people who'd been exposed to asbestos. Mm. They said that the asbestos exposure occurred when they were the insurer, but the wording of the policy meant that uh, they weren't liable to pay. It was only an insurer who was on risk at the right, time they right. developed the disease many years later. But that has been now changed. That's, that's now been changed. The Supreme Court has ruled that um, if the insurance company was on cover at the time people were exposed to asbestos dust, they are liable mm. to pay the compensation. I mean, this is very difficult, isn't it? Because asbestos, asbestosis can take years to come yeah. in. I mean, 40, 50 years before you know you've got it. So this is going to be another long-term campaign, isn't it? I mean, Bill, how, how much do you think government should have to get involved in this sort of campaign? I think the uh, victim support groups uh, have, have welcomed this this week and the fact that there is now, it is now going to be possible to make claims where there was doubt. And mm. There are some in the insurance industry, I'm afraid, who have been dragging their feet and I think it would be right that government made its views very clear to the insurance industry. I think that would be a very, very important step that, that government mm. could take. Um, and uh, I mean, not not to be not to suffer from undue influence from from the the best interests in the insurance industry. I think that would be important. Stuff. Mark, I know you've campaigned, haven't you, Indeed, on this yes. issue? So you must yeah. really welcome this. Story. I do. I think it's a landmark judgment. I think it's very important. We'll give lots of people uh, hope for the future. You're right. It is a disease which unfortunately can take many many years to manifest itself. But when when the cases were first uh, coming to public attention, it surprised me how many more people emerged who were saying. Actually, you know, we've had these problems in our family. We have people who are suffering with this as well. And that's why the judgment this week is, is such a very important one. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. On, this sir. is one of those issues that does transcend party politics. Yeah, and I think we'd all agree yeah. this is a good decision. It allows families, it allows people who were victims of this to move on, to get their compensation and hopefully to... Mm. Uh, to, to get the money that they, they, they deserve. It's very difficult, isn't it? Because it obviously costs these people a lot of money and, and the government is proposing changes to legal aid, isn't it? And there was no win, no fee. I mean, is that going to have an impact, do you think? Uh, well, the House of Lords a few weeks ago voted that uh, asbestos victims would be exempt from the, right. the no win, uh, no fee uh, situation. So as it stands at the moment, that's not going to happen. But of course, it will be going back to the House of Commons. Indeed. And the three of us yeah. here will be having a vote on it when the well, appropriate yeah. time comes. So far, the government has had a habit of over turning amendments moved in the House of Lords that it doesn't like. So I hope that we've just had a promise there from <laughs> two government MPs that they're not at all the needs of victims of asbestos. Thank you, and thanks very much. Thank uh, now it's time for a 60-second look at some of the other stories around this week with Jill Dummigan. Disappointment at Ellesmere Port this week where Vauxhall car workers were hoping to hear more about the plant's future. A high-level meeting in Germany failed to come to any firm conclusions. The parent company General Motors has already said cuts will have to be made somewhere in the European workforce. The new interim chief executive of the Morecambe Bay NHS Foundation Trust has been speaking for the first time since starting his new role. Eric Morton was appointed after problems with the quality of service at the Trust, including poor patient safety and substandard clinical governance. I've got no doubt we'll have an excellent NHS Foundation Trust. I'm absolutely sure that the services that we'll be moving to deliver across the whole of the hospitals in the, in the Foundation Trust will be as good as you'll get in the rest of the country. 
And Manchester's been told it risks a competitive disadvantage if it decides not to have a directly elected mayor. At a reception in Downing Street this week, the government claimed the city could miss out. But the leader of the city council, Sir Richard Leese, says it's about leadership, not titles. <laughs> They're still talking about it over here, but we've run out of time, I'm afraid. Do keep your thoughts and stories coming in. You can email me, annabelle.tiffin at bbc.co.uk. Thank you very much to all my guests today. Now it's back to Andrew Neil.